Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and finance. This week, the cost of fashion, the trade that reshaped Bangladesh's economy, but took so many lives as well. Can the country learn lessons? And is there any prospect for a proper international minimum wage to end what can amount to slave labor? Also this week, tax avoidance. It's not breaking the law, but is it in the spirit of the law? On both sides of the Atlantic, companies like Google and Apple in the dock trying to convince the public that they are paying their fair share during these tough economic times. Hello everyone, we're looking in depth at Bangladesh this week, of course following on from the factory collapse there last month. One of the world's worst industrial accidents that killed more than a thousand people. Part of our show will be a discussion with Mohammed Yunus, a Nobel laureate known globally as the man behind microfinancing, but also a man who's involved in the garments industry in Bangladesh. As you see, he's in our London studio and we'll be talking to him a little bit later on. But first, the crux of the whole thing, the story behind the headline of that tragic building collapse. We're talking about the industry itself. Both Bangladesh and the global community are coming to terms with their roles in the disaster. Because whether you buy your clothes from Walmart or from Giorgio Armani, they were probably produced in Bangladesh, which is ranked number two for garment production. Why? Well, that's where the ugly truth comes out. Garment workers in Bangladesh are the lowest earners in the world. They can expect to earn 24 cents an hour, which as you can see from this chart is a lot lower than the world's other big apparel makers. But it's an important industry. It employs 4 million people, mostly women, and brings in $19 billion a year from the sale of garments. But you know, that's small fry when you compare it to the revenue of, say, Walmart, the big American retailer. Now, to be fair, not all the money it earns is from the sale of apparel, but still, it's a pretty big gulf. And remember, Walmart has refused to sign up to any legally binding safety agreements. So it's multi-layered, isn't it? Even within Bangladesh itself, because even though people are being paid a pittance, they're equally worried that international corporations could now abandon clothes that are made in Bangladesh because of the safety problems. Have a look at this now from Jonah Hull. He has visited the site of the collapsed factory in Dhaka and met one of the survivors. In the low-wage garment sector, 18-year-old Janat is a high earner, or was. At almost $3 a day, she was paid well above the minimum wage, until a month ago, when disaster struck. I couldn't see anyone outside. There were six of us together, but two of them died in front of me. There was another girl nearby, buried up to her neck. She was crying out to God, but I couldn't help her. Janat had worked in one of the garment-making factories inside the eight-story Rana Plaza when it collapsed. Rana Plaza itself would have been from that side to that side. And exactly. The owners had ignored a giant crack in the wall, ordering the workers back inside. At Rana Plaza, an unregulated building trade met the often unscrupulous garment industry head-on, with tragic results. Is this your wife? My wife. She's missing? Or? She's missing. Good, good. Nine people arrested in connection with the building's collapse are said to face possible life sentences. The garment industry here has almost doubled in size just since 2011. It's worth an estimated $20 billion a year, second only in size in the world to China, which Bangladesh expects eventually to overtake. Why? Well, because the cost of labor here is so low, with wages as low as $38 a month, so that a pair of branded jeans that you'd find in Europe or the United States, just like so many garments strewn across the rubble here, typically cost just a quarter of the price to make. But industry experts caution that there is good reason not to abandon clothes made in Bangladesh. I think the, the moral argument is don't end the purchase of Bangladeshi goods because it's going to harm the people over here. We want to improve their conditions. The only way we can improve the condition is to keep on buying and to put pressure on the, on the, on the, on the uh, suppliers and the buyers to improve the condition of these, of, the, of these factories. If the government does join an international coalition of retailers to reform the industry as is now planned, then the factories of the future may look like this. A rare example, clean, safe. Somewhere Janat may one day work her family depends on it.
a future in which more Bangladeshis rise out of poverty without the loss of husbands and sons, daughters and mothers. Well, let's talk to someone now who knows a lot about Bangladesh. Very well-known man, Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus, of course known for empowering the poor through microcredits. He's in London for us, joining us on Counting the Cost today. And we do thank you very much for your time, Mr Yunus. You wrote an article in uh, Britain's Guardian newspaper. You talked about the tragedy at the garment factory in Bangladesh as being a symbol of our failure as a nation. Explain that a little bit more for me, if you would, please. How has the nation failed? Well, it's, it's the most shocking thing that happened to the nation. As, uh, it hits our fundamentals of the nationhood itself because this is our symbol of new, new economic power. For the first time, Bangladesh got involved in a uh, global economy, integrated with the global economy, with a consumer good. So the pre things that we produce in Bangladesh are worn by people all around the developed countries in North America and uh, Europe. Uh, so that was hit by that. The disaster showed how weak that sector is. So we are shaken the, uh, by the fact that uh, the very foundation of our economy is threatened by this incident, by this terrible disaster that happened. And second is, not only it is the foundation of our new economy, the uh, a global econ uh, connection with the global economy is also a, a, a fundamental in terms of our societal transformation because these are all women who work in this mm -hmm. industry, uh, four million uh, women. This is another aspect that where Bangladeshi women, particularly coming from the rural areas, mm -hmm. had a life of a traditional life of being seclusion and remain uh, behind their doors. And now came, get an opportunity to come out and be uh, at the center stage and produce something for the global market. And that transformed the uh, uh, status of the women in Bangladesh. And these are young women. Yeah. Again, this is a very, very basic thing. So everything was shaken by this whole incident, the whole terrible tragedy that took place. And we must find a solution right away. So in order to do that, we have to all get together rather than blame each other. We have to find a solution so that we don't destroy the very foundation on which our economy stands today and the very possibility of transforming the society in a most modern way uh, that we should not only maintain it, we should expand it, we should make it stronger. You rightly describe it as the backbone of the country basically. The industry is the backbone, economically speaking, of the country, and yet it remains such a poorly paid backbone. Why has this not changed? Why does it again take a big tragedy like this for this issue to be brought to uh, light? Yes, uh, the, the suddenly it revealed everything that uh, happened because it was quietly growing and everybody is happy that it's growing um, uh, $18 billion worth of merchandise being sold from Bangladesh to abroad and we are in the number two garment exporter in the whole, whole world. It gives us lots of pride, but we didn't in, uh, get involved in the de details of how this is going on. We thought everything is okay. Uh, occasionally there's a fire in the factory and we get concerned about why the uh, regulatory authorities are not looking into it, why the factory owners are not looking into mm -hmm. it, why the buyers are not looking into it, but we forgot. And uh, if we don't pay attention right now in this biggest tragedy that we've ever had and which rocked the whole uh, foundation of our economy and the society, uh, we'll forget again in a couple of months' time. Let me put some numbers to you about your own company's work, and please correct me if any of these are wrong, but as I understand it, Grameen, your business has garment factories. Starting wages I'm reading here are at about $55 a month, which is definitely higher than others, but it still falls when you break it down below the $2 a day, which is what the United Nations suggests. Uh, why don't you take the lead yourself, pump up your own wages there if you're able to, and, and maybe others will follow, maybe people will realise that the United Nations number is serious and should be adhered to. Uh, first of all, uh, Pope Francis has just told in connection with this disaster that Bangladeshi women are being treated as slave labor. Mm. So we don't want, don't want to be a country of slave labor. We want to have a country with dignified women working uh, with their beautiful skills so that we can make everybody happy with our products. At the same time, we earn a decent income for ourselves. That's a whole idea. And it's today uh, less than 25 cents per hour. That's about the wage uh, uh, our laborers get. And if you can make it 50 cents per hour, the whole thing transforms, the whole thing changes. 
just dramatically. Mm. So all I'm saying, why don't we come up with a kind of international level of uh, minimum wage mm -hmm. so that nobody uh, debates about it, nobody negotiates the price on that. This is a given level and everybody has to ensure it. Buyers ensure it and the producers ensure it. Uh, consumers say we are happy with that. So this is something we have to bring everybody together. You've put forward in this interview a lot of good ideas, a lot of things that could be done. In the end though, it's surely, and this is like, you know, when you get into the climate change argument and things like that, they've got to be legally binding things, things which companies, producers, consumers, everyone will actually stick to. Now you're saying you don't want to apportion, you know, things to individual elements, but someone's got to take legal responsibility and actually have a legally binding agreement, surely. Uh, I put it in two stages. I said one part is can be done voluntarily. A, a, a retailer, a, a buyer uh, in an international market say, I don't want to produce my product, my brand uh, uh, clothes in a factory where wage level is below 50 cents per hour. Uh, this is my decision. I will not do that. I do not want any slave labor. I don't want any sweatshop. And this is my decision. And how I implement it, I go, I move heaven and earth, make sure the workers get this price. If somebody makes the decision, it can be done. It's, it's not something uh, a rocket science, how to make sure that uh, people get 50 cents per hour uh, in my factory where I'm working. This is my factory ultimately. Mm. I'm producing the clothes for the people back home. So this is the way. One. Then see, we can have a consensus article, a consensus thing uh, within the industry. Then comes the regulatory authority and so on. For that part, I'm suggesting creating a garment industry uh, transparency index where the governments will be involved, uh, uh, buyers will be involved, consumers will be involved, uh, producers will be involved, uh, labor will be involved. Say what is, wh whatever we do should be transparent. No hide and seek business in this. A lot of things is very cloudy in garment industry. Mm. Let's reveal everything so that we can make a very transparent thing. We know who is doing what, where, where is the security risk, uh, the building, where is the secu personal security risk, where is the ab abuses of the world workers, where workers have no con no right uh, at all. Uh, they are uh, uh, they don't have any legal right on anything. So how do we establish those legal rights? So that again, ultimately, all we are saying, all these four million women, the young women, they have a uh, decent life for themselves. They don't say we are being exploited by some mighty uh, business people in Bangladesh or mighty business people internationally. They say this is a fair deal for us and we are happy with it. We give our best, we develop our skill and we send our children to school. We have, at our level, we are happy. Mohammed Yunus, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time today. So it seems a properly regulated garments industry in Bangladesh is what people are looking for. As an example, they may well look to Sri Lanka. It has a voluntary campaign called Garments Without Guilt, something which brought in minimum standards for manufacturers and earned Sri Lanka something of an ethical reputation. Manel Fernandez in Colombo takes a look at how and why it works. Chandrani has worked in the garment industry for 26 years, most of them for the same employer. Starting as a helper, she now manages 300 workers. There has been an overall improvement in standards compared to things 10 years ago. Garment employees take home an average wage of $125 a month. Most also get benefits that include medical and transport. Sri Lanka's clothing manufacturers introduced a voluntary scheme six years ago, establishing minimum standards. The Garments Without Guilt campaign covers production, working conditions, child labor, forced labor and sweatshop practices. Gopal Ayer, the owner of a clothing business, says this and other certification required by clients ensure regular checks and balances. Your machinery is kept in proper order. Your aisles are mani managed so that you know, there is enough room for people in case of emergencies for people to get out. Your uh, exits are always there. Proper markings are there. Labor laws, building regulations and board of investment rules under which most garment factories are set up ensure that standards are maintained. Most of the world's top retailers and brands order at least some of their clothes from Sri Lankan factories. In 2011, the industry recorded its highest annual exports, $4 billion. Manufacturers face constant pressure from buyers to keep prices as low as possible. They say clients who insist on ethical manufacturing must be ethical in their buying as well. Sri Lanka is not the cheapest place in the world to make clothes, but industry leaders say 
it has proved that the cost of complying with best practices is worth the investment. We'll spend the second part of this week's show looking at tax, the thing in life referred to as inevitable, alongside death. Only how inevitable is tax for the world's big corporations? Aggressive tax avoidance is dominating politics right now, with the G8 leading nations and European Union making it key issues at their meetings. Because think about it, governments are struggling to revive growth and raise revenue, so people get taxed. And yet some nations are making it easier for corporations to pay less by lowering their tax rates. The OECD is calling it a race to the bottom on corporate rates, and it creates a pretty big problem. $21 trillion has been stashed away by rich individuals and corporations in offshore accounts, which leads the EU to believe tax avoidance and evasion has cost it $1.3 trillion a year. Now, there are two nations that have come under intense scrutiny, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, which together have attracted $5.8 trillion in foreign direct investment. That is more than the US, the UK and Germany all put together. Now, much of that money has come from corporations like online retailer Amazon.com, which roots its European operations through Luxembourg. Check this out. Amazon.com has had sales of $23 billion in the UK over a six-year period, but in that same time only paid $9 million in taxes. Or what about Google, operating from Bermuda and Ireland? It's being accused of immorally avoiding tax payments in the UK. In 2011, Google had revenues of $4.8 billion. Its tax payments, though, $9.6 million in the same 12 months. Just take a look at this exchange in the British Parliament with a Google executive who is accused of misleading parliamentarians about the search company's tax affairs. All you're being asked for here, you're a company that says you do no evil, and I think you do do evil in that you use smokes and mirrors. I don't to think avoid it's a matter of, but I think it's tax is not a matter of choice. Tax is a matter of following the laws that are there well, internationally. And why not throw another tech giant in there, Apple, which had to explain its tax affairs before legislators in the United States? Tom Ackerman looks at that for us. You swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The so senators who summoned Apple executives to Washington never accused the company of anything illegal, but they condemned Apple's tax avoidance strategy, directing most of its non-U.S. profits to three shell companies in Ireland. It does little business there, but pays Ireland a tax rate of less than 2 percent, compared with a 35 percent nominal rate for corporations in the U.S. Apple's a great company, but no company no company should be able to determine how much it's going to pay in taxes, how many profits they're going to keep offshore, how they're going to bring them back home, using all kinds of gimmicks to avoid paying the taxes that should be paid to this country. It's completely outrageous that Apple has not only dodged full payment of U.S. taxes, but it's managed to ev evade paying taxes around the world. Apple CEO Tim Cook was unapologetic. The company, he said, expects to pay $7 billion in U.S. taxes this year, making it the country's biggest corporate taxpayer. But he offered to pay some taxes on offshore profits and eliminate all loopholes if Congress lowered domestic taxes. This would likely result in an increase in Apple's U.S. taxes. But we strongly believe that such comprehensive reform would be fair to all taxpayers, would keep America globally competitive, and would promote U.S. economic growth. President Barack Obama has offered to cut U.S. corporate rates as part of an overall streamlining of the U.S. tax code. Under the present system, nearly $2 trillion in U.S. profits are estimated to be parked in other countries. Meanwhile, the U.K., Australia, and France are complaining that too many companies are exploiting the global patchwork of tax systems to legally sidestep their fair share of payments. And Tom's really hit on the point there. He called it a legal sidestep. And we want to discuss that now with Richard Wellings. He is the Deputy Editorial Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. And Richard, I know this is a big headline-grabbing story, but you know, when it comes down to it, however wrong or morally wrong, as the politicians are saying tax avoidance might be, what is going on is legal. And really, for a company to be looking for ways to save money, that's nothing new. Maybe we should just sort of forgive my phrase, and get over it, except that it does happen. 
Yes, I agree with you there. And of course, a company's first duty is to its shareholders, its owners, and to try and maximize the returns for its shareholders. But I think, I mean, it's not necessarily um, true that it's immoral as well, because it seems to be assumed in this debate that um, government spending and hence taxation is actually moral. But of course, a lot of government spending is deeply morally questionable. I mean, obvious examples are things like um, defense spending on the military and foreign aid that often goes to prop up um, corrupt elites in third world countries. And also a lot of it doesn't go to the poor and the sick, it goes to prop up various middle class vested interest groups, professional groups and so on in the public sector. So we shouldn't assume that government spending is necessarily more moral than corporate investment. So the fact that we have this almost theatre going on in front of Parliament in the UK and in front of Congress in the United States, you know, you're almost saying that to use a phrase here, those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Both sides are guilty of similar quote-unquote crimes. Well, of course, and we know that politicians themselves have an appalling record in terms of corruption, and often they're the people hiding their ill-gotten gains in tax havens and so on themselves. So a lot of them are hypocritical. And also, of course, look at the um, economic benefits of tax competition from tax havens. So this acts as a check on pro predatory politicians who would otherwise raise taxes to very damaging rates in order to pay off various interest groups and essentially buy votes. So this acts as a check on politicians and they know that if they raise tax rates too high, then business will go elsewhere. OK, let's not go too soft on big business here, Richard. You know, we'll swing the argument around for a bit and maybe you can help us out with some thoughts on, you know, how much this is costing, in this case with the research you guys have done, the British economy, because it is a lot of lost money. And when you're talking about companies the size of Amazon and Google, you know, they make more than enough cash here. Well, th these kind of companies have high turnovers, but often uh, they have quite small profit margins because they're focused uh, very much on growth and the long term. So they have low profit margins, they're focused on offering a very good deal to um, consumers uh, in the hope of growing their market share. Um, so, I mean, we, we tend to tax profits rather than turnover because if we tax turnover, then that will be very unfair on low margin businesses. So it's a lot more complicated than the, at first sight. And in your opinion, what should actually be done here? Because as I say, we go through these, these theatres, these, these committees and the accusations fly. But what can actually be done? These are legal loopholes, if you want to use that phrase. You know, I'm sure the companies wouldn't want to say that. But it is legal. And I wonder who's really going to get out there and make them change their ways? Well, I, mean, I think the, the long term strategy should be to um, keep tax rates low so they don't do too much economic damage and also to keep the rules very simple. And of course, we have hugely complex tax rules in most Western countries. So the, the tax code in the UK is around 10,000 pages long. And of course, the, the big companies can afford to employ these specialist tax accountants and tax lawyers and have uh, departments uh, designed to avoid tax and minimise the payouts, which is unfair on the small businesses, of course, which can't afford all those sort of administration functions. So it needs to get, get a lot simpler, uh, the rules and, and lower rates would help. What we don't want is um, the government to try to uh, overcomplicate the tax system and I'm afraid this is what's going to happen that various governments across the world are going to just add more and more rules which will actually be counterproductive in the long term. So you're saying keep taxes low but this is of course a time of high taxation uh, maybe the problem here is the split between the everyday people who can't afford a tax hike and the big business and the big earners who everyone feels should be paying more tax. You know you keep talking about keeping taxes simple. Can that be done whilst also acknowledging that split and differentiating between the high earners and the low earners? Well, I, I don't necessarily think that the government should be trying to differentiate it. Um, of course, if, if, if uh, larger companies are more productive and are growing more quickly, then that should be allowed to happen. And if the balance between small and large companies changes, then that's fine as long as it's not distorted too much by government intervention and, and becomes inefficient. But I think you're right in the sense that um, governments in the Western world, they have these enormous debts, huge budget deficits, and they're desperate to grab up a few, a few billion extra pounds from reducing tax avoidance. But in the longer run, this will be entirely counterproductive because um, lower profits for these companies mean less investment and less investment means less growth. In the long run, less growth means the economy is smaller and there's actually less money for public services like health and education. So politicians should be very cautious here. They could end up uh, biting off the hand that feeds them. Richard Wellings from the Institute of Economic Affairs talking tax with us. Thank you for your time.
And that is our show for this week. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash business. That's where you'll find the latest business headlines. Also a link to the Counting the Cost page where you can watch this or any of our previous episodes again. And then if you want to get in touch, it's very simple. Tweet me at Kamal AJE, our business editor at Abid Oliver Ali, or drop us an email. Counting the Cost at aljazeera.net is the address. Uh, but that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.